Hello, hello, and welcome back to Recitation. My name is Jacob, and I'm going to be your TA for this 4.30 time slot. And while my hair may be getting longer, your time in this course is not. We're coming to a close. Just one more week left. That's one more recitation. Yes, we do have recitation next week on that last, I guess, day of classes. Uh, that one last final recitation, uh, and then your final exam, and that's it. That's the end of this topsy-turvy, tumultuous semester. Uh, that we've all been through. It's been a wild ride. Thank you for being along it with us, helping make it a good experience. We've done our best. You guys have done yours. We're going to finish it strong. Today, we're going to be talking about the final graph stuff we didn't get to last week. That's going to be minimum spanning trees. We'll talk about it in terms of Kruskal's algorithm, which is probably the more interesting of the two algorithms to find MSTs. Then we'll do a brief intro into dynamic programming and talk about the one DP algorithm we get to in this class, which is LCS. It's really just cause an intro before you see it in other classes so that you have some exposure to it before you kind of learn it proper. After that, uh, I'll maybe get to do some fun math stuff with Kruskal's and then we'll call it quits and then next week will be pretty much final exam review. So with that said, first we're going to go ahead and go to those slides I was using last week. So remember, these are the same slides that are on Canvas. Uh, exact same slides I used last week, it's just the one slide I skipped over, the fifth slide, right at the end. Uh, just some review of terminology. Remember that subgraphs are where we take some starting graph, pick out some vertices, pick out some edges from it, and just use that one instead. Really, the only rule we have is that we can't pick edges that connect vertices that we didn't pick. So if I have like five vertices in my graph, I can't take only the edges. I have to take some of the vertices too. Remember, connected graph. That means if I start from any vertex, I can go along edges and reach any other vertex I want. There's no like gaps or rifts or anything, no weird lone vertices. That would be a disconnected graph. So that's if I have any vertex, maybe it's one, maybe it's a group, but I can't reach it from all the other vertices, or I, if I start at that vertex, I can't reach the others. A cycle is if I can start at a vertex, go along a series of edges that don't, like I don't go along the same edge twice, and then reach back to the vertex I started with. If a graph has no cycles at all, we call it an acyclic graph. Now remember, if we combine these properties, a tree is just a graph that is connected and acyclic. So we just need to meet those two properties and we have a tree. And again, tree means exactly the same thing it did when we talked about it in terms of binary trees or BSTs, two, four trees. It's the exact same kind of tree. We're not introducing a new word here. We're just introducing it in terms of a new topic. A new word we are going to introduce is a spanning tree. Now a spanning tree, when I say spanning tree, it's a spanning tree of some graph. So if I give you a graph, I can say a spanning tree of this graph. And what it is, is it's a subgraph, which means I use vertices and edges from the original graph. I have to include all vertices uh, from the graph. We had a question though. Uh, we still need to know prims for the final exam, right? Uh, we will release a topic list for that. I don't believe we've decided that yet. So we have to include all the vertices from the original graph. So in this case, it's V instead of V prime. Uh, but I need it to be acyclic and connected. So it needs to be a tree. So I just need to pick some edges from this graph that don't introduce any cycles but still connect the entire graph. If I don't start with an already connected graph, then there's no way that I can pick edges that give me a connected graph. So if I'm dealing with an unconnected graph, it doesn't have a spanning tree. So if I hand you some unconnected graph and say, what's the spanning tree? The answer is just there is none. There's really no meaningful answer. So what is a minimum spanning tree? We're introducing this extra M here. We'll almost always abbreviate this just as MST, by the way. A minimum spanning tree is a spanning tree, so exact same definition here, but it has minimum weight, which means that if I look at all of the possible spanning trees of some graph, and I sum up all of the edge weights of each of those spanning trees, I'm going to pick whichever one had that smallest sum. So if I have like one spanning tree that includes a bunch of weight one edges and one that includes a bunch of weight tens, I'm gonna pick the one with a weight one. And that does bring me to a point I didn't really mention er earlier. Uh, graphs can potentially have multiple spanning trees. So this doesn't have to be unique. This doesn't have to be unique either. If you can imagine if I'm dealing with like a click or a perfect graph where every vertex is connected to every other vertex with all exact same edge weight, there's a bunch of different possible minimum spanning trees I could pick. 
So neither of these two are necessarily unique at all. A good way to think about MSTs are kind of like a stripped down graph. So I remove any unnecessary edges, I'm saying that with air quotes here, that kind of connect redundant things. Again, just like unconnected graphs don't have a spanning tree, they obviously can't have a minimum spanning tree. And then they can have multiple MSTs if there's multiple sets of edges with the same weight. Um, it's really hard to come up with MSTs that use different like weight edges and don't just have like a duplicate edge weight for pick one edge or the other, uh, but I think that is possible. Um, a rule about MSTs is that there is always V minus one undirected edges, or if I'm dealing with directed edges, that means instead of one edge, I have an edge going from like U to V, then V back to U, so two edges. So if it's directed edges, I have twice as many. And the reason for that is just because since it's a tree and can't have any cycles, this is the only possible number of edges you can have. If you're interested in proving this fact, you can actually do it by induction. Uh, if you've taken or are taking CS2050 or 2051, I encourage you to try it. It's a pretty interesting proof. If not that hard, you should hopefully be able to figure it out. Um, remember what I just said, undirected edges are just two directed edges. And on your homework, if you had to code this, that would be what it looked like. And the reason that this condition is important is because this is both a terminating condition and validity check for our algorithm. Now, terminating condition makes sense. We saw that a lot on the algorithms last week. We had that like while not visited all vertices. So we're gonna have like a while not complete MST. But the validity check is a bit new and we will get to that at the end of the algorithm. But it kind of deals with this fact that some graphs don't have an MST. And there's really no way of knowing that until we try to make it ourselves. So I'm going to go on the next slide again. If you need these slides, they're on Canvas. Don't worry about copying everything down now. Uh, also, if you weren't here last week, remember on this platform, if you can hit that pause button, uh, you don't have to worry about missing things. You can pause, resume at the exact point you were paused, rewind, go back and forth as much as you want. You don't need to worry about missing anything. So just as an example, this is like my starting graph here. And these red edges represent a minimum spanning tree. You'll notice I have six vertices in my graph, which means I should have five edges. That's V minus one. And you'll see that's the number of edges I have. If we consider them directed edges, then I would have 10. A to B, B to A, B to D, D to B, D to C, C to D, D to F, F to D, D to E, and E to D. So it was just two for each one of these red lines. Uh, and that would just be in code. And if you sum up all of these edge weights, you'll see that uh, what, it's 11? And if I picked any of these other really expensive edges, then the total sum of those weights would be a lot larger. You'll see that there's other spanning trees I could make. If I didn't take this edge and I took this one instead, this B to C on a nine, that would still be a spanning tree, but it would no longer have minimum weight. So it wouldn't be a minimum spanning tree. Now, hopefully you understand at this point what a minimum spanning tree is. So we're gonna go ahead and go back to the board and now start talking about Kruskal's algorithm. All right, so Kruskal's is an algorithm that we're going to use in order to find an MST for some graph. Now, uh, MST, like a lot of the MST algorithms only really work well when we're starting with an undirected graph. That's because what connected is can be a bit different when you're dealing with undirected versus directed graphs. So in this class, we're only gonna talk about MSTs with undirected graphs. I do have a question though. If we are given a disconnected graph, is there a way to tell by coding, not diagramming at the beginning or early on that it is a disconnected graph, hence there won't be a valid MST, or is the only way to wait until the code terminates when the number of vertices in the list is less than the number of vertices in the graph? Excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, so you'll see in our algorithm, we're going to check it at the end, but it's a very good question. Could we check it at the beginning? And the answer is yes, we could if we wanted to. We actually already know exactly how we would do that. We can use BFS or DFS, and those are relatively quick algorithms that can go across the entire graph, and we know that uh, those will return not every vertex if our graph is disconnected. The issue is those still do take a pretty significant amount of time to run. So even though we could run BFS or DFS early on to determine whether or not we have a minimum spanning tree, uh, it's generally not really worth it because it's a lot of extra time we're spending. You'll see that a lot of the MST algorithms are still relatively cheap. So you don't, 
It's not like you're incurring a huge cost to run it and check it at the end, but that is a very excellent question. Thank you for asking it. You could check it at the beginning, but it's not always the best idea. It is a little bit faster in some cases, but it's very much slower in cases where you do have a connected graph. So how does Kruskal's algorithm work? Again, we're undirected graphs. Kruskal's algorithm is actually going to use a new data structure we haven't talked about in this class and won't really talk about too much beyond this called a disjoint set. You don't need to worry too much about the disjoint set and like how it's implemented, especially because you don't have to like deal with it on your homework. But basically how it works is we start with a bunch of different elements. In this case, we're going to use the vertices in our graph. And every element starts in its own cluster. So we can name these clusters, whatever we want. Uh, but every element is kind of in its own cluster. And then we can use the find operation on any element to tell us what cluster it's in. And we can use the union operation on two elements to join the clusters that they're a part of. A way you can think about this for anyone that's played the game Civilization is if you think about all of the civs at the start of the game are kind of all their own cluster. But then when one civ kind of loses to another civ, if they get like their capital taken, they union together with the civ that took them over. And now if you're like, uh, say, the US uh, conquers Russia in Civ or something. So now if you say, okay, what is the cluster, what is the Civ that Moscow was a part of? Now it would say, oh, that's a part of the US now because those two clusters union together. Uh, there's a lot of different analogies you could think of for disjoint sets. That's just kind of the first one that popped into my head. I haven't really used them before to help, so maybe that's useful to you. If it's not, sorry. But we'll see how these operations work when we look at the example. But it is kind of a weird uh, data structure and how it works. But we have these two operations, find and union, and those are going to be the important parts. Other data structures we use in Kruskal's algorithm is a normal hash set. This is perfectly normal. So this is a weird disjoint set. It's not a hash set. This is a normal hash set. This is just going to store all of the edges that we return. So we would need this if we were doing Prim's algorithm as well. This is the thing we're actually returning at the end of the method. Every method you do for graphs needs this. Uh, it's just a hash set for Kruskal's. And finally, we need a priority queue. And the priority queue is going to tell us what order we should look at the edges. Something I want to stress, I did mention this last week if you were at my part of the recitation, that a most of the graph algorithms we talk about in this course are a variant of breadth-first search. Kruskal's is the one we talk about that is not a variant of Red First Search. This is very much a different algorithm. The other MST algorithm that we're not going to talk about today is called Prim's. Prim's is a variant of Red First Search. Kruskal's is not. So this is actually a different algorithm, which is why we chose to talk about it today. This priority queue is going to tell us to how do we look at the edges. The basic idea of this whole algorithm is that we're going to start adding edges to our MST from the smallest to largest but we're only going to add edges that don't create a cycle because if we ever created a cycle we obviously wouldn't have a tree anymore so we don't have a valid minimum spanning tree but if we add v minus one edges that don't create a cycle and we add them from smallest to largest you can think about you can pretty easily see how that would create a minimum spanning tree so that's kind of the goal with cross goals let's see how it looks in the actual algorithm. All right, so we got a couple steps to the algorithm. Let's take a look at it. The first thing we need to do is our generic initialization. Every algorithm has something like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to initialize the disjoint set. I wrote this very poorly, I'm sorry. Just initialize the disjoint set. That's going to be with all the vertices. Let me actually add that. So we're going to initialize it with all the vertices. Remember, that means every vertex starts in its own cluster. Then we're going to initialize the priority queue with all the edges. If you remember from your sorting homework, we can do the collection constructor of the priority queue, which uses the build heap algorithm. So we just take graph.edgeList, throw it into the priority queue constructor, and magically we now have a priority queue that will give us the edges back smallest edge weight first. And that's very important. Then we have our while loop. Our two conditions are the priority queue not being empty. Uh, this is kind of our condition for do we have a, 
if we exhaust the priority queue, that means we probably didn't have a valid MST. Not necessarily, but usually. And our other condition is going to be that thing I mentioned earlier. While we haven't found an MST, what that means is, is the MST's size 2 times the uh, number of vertices minus 1? Is to basically count the number of edges in your MST, is that the exact size you expect? That's what I mean when I say MST found. During this loop, we're going to dequeue the next edge we get from our priority queue, and I'm going to call that edge UV. That's just the start vertex, the end vertex. Why these are standard letters, I don't know. They look too similar. I always will try to put the tail with the U so you can tell which is which, but it doesn't matter too much for this one. Then we're going to use our disjoint set. So I'm going to check find U and find V. So what this does is find U gives me the cluster U is a part of. Find V gives me the cluster that V is a part of. If they're in the same cluster, they'll give me back the same thing. If they're in different clusters, they'll give me different things. So find U does not equal find V means is U in a different cluster than V? If they're in different clusters, what I'm going to do is I'm going to union them together. So after this, they'll be in the same cluster. So you can see if I get the same edge again, I'm going to skip it because now they're in the same cluster. And then I'm going to add that edge to my MST. So you see I have mst.add uv. I also would probably have this mst.add vu, adding the reverse edge, because I'm dealing with directed graphs, most or directed edges, even though it's an undirected graph. It's just the easier way to store it in memory. So this is where I would get that like 2 times v minus 1. That's the important part. Then, this is still part of the code, by the way. After this loop completes, it's a pretty short loop, I check if MST is found again. Now that seems weird. I check it in my loop and I check it out here. Isn't that a little redundant? Well, the thing is, we have two conditions here. And as I've kind of mentioned, you do need both of them. Because if I run out of edges, I can't keep going. And if I complete an MST, then there's no reason to keep going. But once I exit this loop, I have no way of actually knowing why. I don't know if I exited because I emptied my priority queue or if I exited because I found an MST. So I'm just going to check. If I found an MST, then that means that regardless of how I exited this loop, if it was because I dequeued the last edge to create my valid MST, or I had 50 edges left in the priority queue and made a valid MST, I found it. I'm just going to return it. If I didn't find a valid MST, this means that the graph was disconnected that there was no possible valid MST I could have made, and I'm just going to return null. That's more common, generally, instead of throwing an exception. Uh, as the student wonderfully mentioned earlier, this isn't necessarily the most efficient way if you have a lot of disconnected graphs, because you could have, in theory, checked it at the start. But if you're mostly expecting to handle connected graphs, then this is perfectly fine, because this case won't happen that often. And doing an entire depth-first or breadth-first search at the start of your method uh, isn't ideal if you're if you want a really good algorithm. Now I'll talk about the time complexity a little bit now. I will mention that the lecture videos on this I believe are wrong because we've had it differently in the past. We decided to change it. This is what we're going with now. It is going to be O of E log V. I will hopefully have time at the end of this recitation to get to the proof of where that comes from. It's actually really cool. It's a bunch of really interesting math. But you don't need to know that for this course. This is kind of the important thing. E log V, that's your cross goals efficiency. We probably wouldn't ask about it on a test because we've had issues with it in the past. But that's what kind of we expect is the answer. So we'll give you guys a little bit to ask questions. And then I will head over to the visualization tool. So you can pull it up for yourself if you want. And we'll run through an example of what cross goals algorithm looks like. So you do have a question. Uh, if I understand correctly, if size of MST edge set is 2 times V minus 1, then we are done with cross goals. Yes, that is exactly correct. If we ever hit this magical size, cross goals is done. Because any edge we add in would create a cycle into our graph. So we have to have it done at this. Uh, 
And also, if I understand correctly, a disconnected graph case would be triggered with the implementation of cross goal if the priority queue empties first. Not necessarily. With only one counterexample to that, and that's when both of these happen at the exact same time. If priority queue empties when we haven't found an MST, yes, you're exactly correct. That means we have a disconnected graph. But it's very possible. If you think about if I call cross goals on a graph, so on I have to take all of the edges, then the priority queue is going to empty at the exact same time as I find an MST. So you have to, this is the more safe condition to check. You shouldn't check, is my priority queue empty at the end? You should check if you've created a valid MST. Good question though. And I do have another message. Uh, Prims is fair game for the final. So someone asked me that at the start of recitation and I wasn't sure, but Prims is completely fair game for the final. We could ask about it. But let's go ahead and head over to the visualization tool now. So we can look at an example of cross goals. This is the default graph. So if you want to follow along, uh, it should be the first thing that happens when you pull it up. Or you can just click on this default graph button and it will bring you back to this example. You can see I've paused at the very start. So let's take a look at what we're dealing with here. You can see right here is my priority queue. I have all of the edges in the graph. Uh, you can see, in this case, I just kind of have the undirected edges. I don't have like both of them going back and forth with their weights associated with them. You can see they're not in any particular order yet, uh, but we will fix that later. I have another question though. Why are mst.add uv and mst.add vu next to each other in the algorithm? The real answer to that question is because I remembered it later and ran out of space. Uh, the uh, other answer is because normally we're deal the implementation of graphs uses only directed edges. So we would need to add kind of the forward edge and the reverse edge. Otherwise, we don't actually, the thing we're returning isn't necessarily usable. Uh, I, someone also wanted an example of what I mentioned earlier. If you start with a tree, so if you like looked at the example from that graph slide, if you take only the MST and try to call Kruskal's algorithm on it, you'll see that you will empty the priority queue and complete an MST at the exact same time. The very last edge you dequeue from a priority queue will be the edge you put into the MST. You can do that with any tree, but as long as you start with the tree, you're guaranteed to have that case. Uh, it could happen with graphs too. Um, you'll see if we deleted, I think this one edge from this graph, uh, it would happen, but that's the easiest case for it to happen. Okay, so we've got this priority queue. We also have this disjoint set. You'll see these are all the vertices in my graph. And what I have here in this column is the set ID. So that's one through eight. They also have their own color associated with them. So it's a little easier to see. Uh, each of these vertices starts out in its own set. So A is a different set from B, from C, etc. Let's start looking through this algorithm and see what happens. The first thing that's going to happen is we sort this priority queue. This happens in the back end. You don't need to do this yourself. It also doesn't really sort it in this order. Remember, it'll be in heap order. Uh, but the basic idea is this top thing is always going to be the smallest weight. So now we start our main loop. We dequeue this edge from the priority queue, and we're going to look at the both vertices in our disjoint set. So we do a find of f, and that's going to say f is in set 6. Then we're going to do a find of h, and it's going to say h is in set 8. Now these two sets are different from each other, which means that this edge will not create a cycle. So I'm going to do those two steps I mentioned earlier. I'm going to union them. I'm going to add this edge to my MST. So I don't, it's just indicated here by being highlighted, and then I'm going to union these two sets together. Now, the real, I guess a question could be, do I put F in H's set or H in F set? When they're the same size set, it doesn't matter. When they're different size sets, you always want to union the smaller set into the larger set. And that would be handled by the disjoint set implementation. You wouldn't need to do that part yourself. And the reason for that is uh, really more dealing with like the actual time complexities of a disjoint set, which is beyond the scope of right now. A uh, question, I'm assuming we always do the last if statement for prims to check for MSTs at the end after the while loop terminates. Yes, you need to do that check for prims too for the exact same reason. Uh, I don't think the videos mentioned that. They might not. Uh, but yes, you need that exact same check in prims for the exact same reason. So let's union these sets together. You'll see in this case, 
that's going to put H in F set, so they're both in set 6 now, and we can move on to the next edge. A, B, we find on both of them, they're in different sets right now, so we add that edge to our MST, you'll see that these edges are in completely different places, this is very different from prims, but we add this edge to our MST, and we union these sets together, so now they're both going to go into set 1. So these sets are going to slowly merge together one by one until we're hopefully left with just one set that all of the vertices are in, and that's going to be when we have our valid MST. But the easiest way to check that is just by looking at the number of edges we have. For reference, you can see that we have eight vertices, so we're expecting to have seven edges in our graph. Right now we've got two. The next edge is this BG1. We can see that B is now in set 1, so it's different than what it was before, but we have, we can still get what set it's in. And G is in set 7, again, different, so we add this to our MST, and we union these two sets together. This is important, the only, before it was kind of arbitrary which numbers I changed, but in this case, I need to put G into set 1. You can see if I wanted to put A and B into set 7, I would have had to change two numbers here, versus here I only need to change one number. That's not exactly the actual like comp complexity reason why, but that's a very good way to think about it and think about why putting the smaller set into the bigger set is important. Again, not really relevant in this course right now, but useful to think about. So let's union F and G together. You can see that uh, both of these are different sets. F is in six, G is in one. So we can add this edge to our MST and then we can union these sets together. You'll notice 1 has 3 things in it, and 6 has 2 things in it, so that means that I should be changing the two 6s to both be 1s. So when I union the sets, both of those become 1s now. So now this is one really large set, and C, D, and E are in their own cluster. I D, Q, G, H, but now if we look at these two, find is going to return the exact same thing. They're both in set 1 which means I, this edge would create a cycle. And if we look, we can see that cycle right here. It's really obvious. Really obvious to us looking at it, less obvious to the code. So because this edge would create a cycle, it clearly can't be a part of our MST because MSTs are trees and trees are acyclic. So this edge should be thrown out completely. We're skipping the edge. The next edge is this DF. We can look and see that those are in different clusters. So we're adding that edge to our MST, and we're going to union the sets by changing this to a 1. AC is our next edge. Again, different clusters. So we add the edge and union them, which changes this to a 1. So now we're almost done. We just need this one, figure out how to integrate E into our MST. But we're going to have to deal with a couple extra edges first. This BC7, you'll notice that our two finds return the same thing which means that I skip this edge because it creates this cycle. BD, again, same cluster. It would create this cycle right here. So I throw out the edge. Now I get to this finally EG10. And we look, we're going to see that these are in different clusters, so I can add this edge to my MST. I can union the sets, which changes this to a 1. And now after I DQ this edge, I'm going to do that check at the beginning. My priority queue isn't empty yet. I have one thing left in it. But if you count, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 edges in my MST. And if you remember, that's exactly the number of edges I expected to have because I have 8 vertices in my graph. So I know I've created my valid MST. Any edges left in the priority queue would only create cycles, so I can throw them all away and just return the MST that I've created. I would do one more check to make sure that I actually had an MST, but obviously I do, so I would just return this. MST has the number of correct edges done. This one edge is just sitting here. So I'll give you guys a second to ask questions about that, but otherwise we will get on with our recitation and keep going with dynamic programming.
All right, nothing yet. So we'll go ahead and move back, check that one off, and let's start talking about DP. That is, this is pretty much the final topic we're going to talk about in this course. It's very much just intended to be an intro into it. You'll talk about it a lot more in classes like 3510 and 3511, but this is just going to give you a first exposure so that it's not completely foreign when you see it for the first time. So what is dynamic programming? Dynamic programming is a problem-solving strategy. So we have a lot of different techniques we use to solve problems. DP is just another one of them. And what it, how it works, how to recognize DP things, is they rely on solving sub-problems that overlap. Something I want to mention and that confuses a lot of people, including me. Uh, sorry, we got another question. So prims and cross goals work only on undirected graphs. For the purposes of this class, yes. If you call them on a directed graph, you'll get something back. But what you get back doesn't really have the same meaning as anything we talk about in this class. So for the purposes of this class, prims and cross goals work only on undirected graphs. So the big thing is DP versus divide and conquer, because that also involved splitting things up into subproblems. But the thing in divide and conquer is those subproblems didn't overlap at all. When I talked about when we talk about merge sort, you split the array in half, then in half again. So all of those are individual halves that don't touch each other. But dynamic programming, these subproblems are going to overlap each other a ton. And we're going to use each subproblem to solve the next successively larger subproblem, essentially. Versus in divide and conquer, we solved each subproblem completely and then kind of merged solutions together. So, another really common thing in dynamic programming is we store the result of our subproblem. So, if we ever need it again, we don't have to recalculate it from scratch. We have the stored result. So we're going to see that we end up solving a subproblem and using that solution again. A really common application of dynamic programming is in recursive problems, because if we're dealing with a method that makes a lot of recursive calls, it's possible that it might make the same recursive call twice. Not necessarily at the same time, maybe like six calls later it reaches the same thing it did in the very beginning. So if we store the results of our method every time we get it, if we ever get a second call again, we don't have to recalculate it. And that process is called memoization. This is not memorization, the word looks like it, it's memoization. Sometimes it's also called caching, exact same thing in this case. And we can use this memoization technique to reduce some of our time complexities, sometimes from exponential time complexities, which are really bad, as we're seeing right now in real life. Exponential stuff is really bad. And we can reduce it to something that's polynomial, which in computer science, polynomial stuff is really good. And a really cool thing is we've actually already used DP in this class. When we built the failure table in KMP, that was our overlapping subproblems. Each subproblem was figuring out the largest prefix suffix match of a string, and then using that to figure out the largest prefix suffix match of the string with one extra character added onto it over and over and over again until eventually we got to our full string. And that was an example of DP. So we're going to use that first in a problem that you've probably seen before, and then we'll look at an algorithm that is really only feasible with a DP solution. Give you guys a couple more seconds to write this down or ask questions. Again, you can pause the video uh, while it's live to copy things down if you want. Just want to make sure everyone has time and I'm not going too fast. But this is pretty much just an introduction slide. Okay, so what's well, a problem that we've hopefully all seen before at this point? Good old Fibonacci, the classic recursive example uh, that most people know about. If you're not familiar with Fibonacci, it has an incredibly simple definition. The zeroth Fibonacci number is zero, the first Fibonacci number of one, and any other Fibonacci number is you take the Fibonacci number right before it and the Fibonacci number two before it, and you add them together, and that's how you get the new one. So Fibonacci kind of has the sequence 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, etc. Goes kind of fast. So how do we actually determine what the nth Fibonacci number is? This is a really common example of when you write your first ever recursive solution, and it looks probably something like this. 
you have this int Fibonacci function. If n is less than or equal to 1, you just return n. Otherwise, you return a recursive call on n minus 1 and a recursive call on n minus 2. That's exactly how the problem is defined. That's exactly how we wrote our solution. It's a really easy way to explain recursion to people that are kind of familiar with math. But if we actually look at what recursive calls we're doing, uh, a question, does dp relate in some way to the p versus np problem? Not really directly. Uh, when I mention like exponential stuff versus polynomial stuff, if I can make it polynomial from exponential, that would mean it's not actually an np because I have a polynomial alg algorithm to solve it. It's just we might have a bad solution that's in exponential time, and dynamic programming gives us a good solution that's in polynomial time. So it's not really related to p versus np, but good connection. We look at this Fibonacci call. We make our call on like 5, for instance, and that's a small number. But if you look, this branches really quickly. I have to make a call on 4 and 3, then 3 and 2, 2 and 1, and this goes down. But you'll see that there's some work being done here multiple times. If I go down this side of the tree, you'll see I have to calculate Fibonacci of 3 over here. But here, I have to calculate that same number again, Fibonacci of 3. So it doesn't really make sense to calculate these twice. I'm doing a ton of extra work to do that. And a Fibonacci that works like this is an exponential time algorithm. It's roughly O of 1.6 to the n. It's not quite 2 to the n uh, because it doesn't branch evenly, but it's really bad. If you write this function on your computer and try to call it with like a Fibonacci number of 100, it's just not going to finish. That algorithm is just not going to work. But how do people deal with Fibonacci numbers? It's because there's much better ways to code it than an algorithm like this. And we can come up with one of those better ways using, you might have guessed, dynamic programming. So let's look at a good version of this using dynamic programming. So just like I mentioned before, these are kind of two solutions. I'll talk about this one first. We're going to create this memo. And this memo is going to map from integers to integers. These will be inputs into the Fibonacci function to outputs from the Fibonacci function. What I'm going to do now is my new function is the same base case as before. If n is less than or equal to 1, I just return it. We always need a base case. Then instead of automatically doing my recursive calls, I'm going to check, does my memo have this n key, this argument that I've, have I calculated before? Is it in my memo? If it is in my memo, I'm just going to return the value that was in my memo because that means I've solved it before. I know the answer to this problem. There's no point in recomputing it. I'm just going to get the answer back in O of 1 time. Remember, maps are really fast, O of 1 time. Get that answer back and return it. Only if it's not in my memo am I actually going to do this work. And now I do kind of have this extra step. I calculate the result, and remember these will maybe result in other like gets in my memo. I might not have to actually do a full exponential tree of work. But I get this result from my memo, I put or from my function, I add that into my memo because this wasn't there before. I want to put it in so that I never have to recalculate it again, and then I return it. And that's a pretty good way to do Fibonacci with dynamic programming. But we can actually do a little bit better because our subproblems are kind of always increasing. If I want to solve like the nth Fibonacci number, I need to solve all like the first through nth Fibonacci numbers. I can't like skip any. So I might as well just calculate all of them in order instead of relying on these weird recursive calls. And this is a method sometimes called tabulation. And this is a little bit better than this uh, memoization method. In this case, I create an array, and this array is just going to store all my Fibonacci numbers. If I wanted to make this a little more memory efficient, I could make this just a size 2 array, but I'm going to store all of them. So you'll see that this is a size n plus 2 array. Honestly, this n plus 2 is just lazy because we didn't want to handle all the edge cases for n of 0 or 1, so this is going to be not perfect, but it will work. Then I'm going to handle my base cases. That would be f of 0 equals 0, but you'll remember that's the default value for an int array. And then f of 1 equals 1, which I do need to do manually. Then I'm just going to do a normal for loop. So I'm going to start at 2, go all the way to n, which is my starting value. Uh, a question, even though dp problems are recursive in nature, we prefer bottom-up approach, right? It's because of space complexity and the recursive stack. Uh, yes, that's we generally want like bottom-up approaches 
because those tend to be a little bit faster. That's kind of what uh, this is. So this is a top-down approach, and this is a bottom-up approach. And this bottom-up approach, you'll see, looks a lot cleaner, doesn't use a ton of recursive stack space. It's really nice. So uh, you'll talk about bottom-up versus top-down in other classes. It's not as relevant here. But yes, this is top-down, this is bottom-up. So we're just going to loop from 2 to n, and we're just going to keep filling in each of these Fibonacci values. So f of k is f of k minus 1 plus f of k minus 2. You'll note these aren't recursive calls anymore. They're just getting numbers from an array. So this line is now O of 1 time. So this loop happens pretty quickly. It's not really bad like the recursive method. And then after I filled out this whole array, I just return the nth Fibonacci number, which will be in there because this loop got to it. Now, both of these methods, this one's really obvious, this one might take some convincing, but both of these methods are O of n, which is a lot better than exponential. Now, yes, people that know a lot of math and stuff know that this isn't actually the best we can do with Fibonacci. It is possible to go better, but that better solution doesn't use dynamic programming at all. Uh, so this is a really nice way to explain dynamic programming. The purpose of this example isn't, wow, here's a really cool problem that's only solved by dynamic, dy by dynamic programming. The purpose is, here's a familiar problem that we can improve the solution from the obvious solution to a good solution using dynamic programming. And that's the purpose of this example. The next example is going to be a problem that we actually use dynamic programming to get a, our best solution. So, let's go ahead and look at the real problem of the day. And that problem is LCS, which is longest common subsequence. This is subsequence, not substring. So, obvious question, what's a subsequence? Because a lot of people haven't seen that term before starting this class. A subsequence is just, I have some string, I take a subset of the characters out of that string, and I keep them in the same order that they were in the original string. So if brown is the string I'm starting with, we always use the head TA's last name, uh, but if this is the string I'm starting with, possible subsequences I can deal with are bro, the first three characters. Those happen to be in order, but they don't have to be, because bon is also a valid subsequence. You see I took the first, middle, and last characters. They're in the exact same order as they were in the original string. Uh, of, uh, another question is, for the better DP solution, can I explain why the array capacity is n plus 2? That's just because I was, it's, otherwise you have to uh, code the base case of what if they call it with uh, 1, or what if they call it with 0, then you kind of have to hard code those values. That's just the way of handling the base case. You don't have to do it that way, it just made the code a little shorter to write on the board. There's not really a huge reason, though. There's a lot of other ways to write that solution. That's definitely not the only way. So, other valid subsequences. The entire string is a valid subsequence. It's all of the characters in the same order. RWN, you'll see it's these three characters in the same order. Any singular character from the original string is a valid subsequence, because there's no order I even need to keep. So O is a subsequence, W is a subsequence. Things that are not subsequences are BOR, you'll see that that's these first three characters, but I've switched the order of the first two, so it's not a valid subsequence anymore. Norb isn't a subsequence, that's the entire string, but it's backwards. Remember, the order has to stay the same. I don't need to keep characters next to each other, but characters can't kind of cross each other. So Bon was fine, it's three characters in the same order, but this isn't fine because it's all the characters different order. Obviously, if it includes any characters not in my original string, it's not a valid subsequence. And this NW, that's those last two characters flipped, not a valid subsequence. So, what is our problem? We have two strings. I'm going to call them X and Y. X has length N, Y has length M. And I want to know what is the longest subsequence that is in both strings. That's all that matters. Uh, and a really, the really obvious way that you might think to do this, if you're seeing this problem for the first time, is, okay, let's look at all of the subsequences in X and check if they're in Y, and then just return the longest one. The issue is there's two to the N subsequences in X. For every character in X, I can either include it in the subsequence or not. So if I look at all of the subsequences of X, that's an exponential number of subsequences, 
And then for each of them, I have to check whether or not it's in Y, and that takes M time. So this is an exponentially bad algorithm, and we can do better. And the next page is going to show us how we do better with our dynamic programming algorithm. I'll give you guys a bit to write this down and ask questions while I take a drink of water. All right, no new questions, so let's move on to our last page of content, actually. Let's talk about the good way to do LCS. So the first thing I'm going to do, this is really similar to the tabulation I did for our Fibonacci, is I'm going to create an array. But in this time, instead of creating a one-dimensional array, I'm going to create a two-dimensional table. And that table is going to be length m plus 1 by n plus 1. I have another question, MST again. Um, if we are dealing with an undirected graph, why was the validity condition 2 times n minus 1 instead of n minus 1? That's because even if we have an undirected graph, it's still really common to implement it with directed edges, just having two directed edges for every single vertex. That's just really an implementation thing that's not really like any huge reason that like breaks computer science. Uh, that's just how it tends to look in code. And especially like when we're testing stuff on your homework, that's how we implement undirected graphs on your homework. So that would be how it looks. Uh, but the basic idea is n minus 1 direct undirected edges or 2 n minus 1 directed edges. But even if it's an undirected graph, we still might implement it with two directed edges per edge, if that makes sense. So n plus 1 by n plus 1 table. And this isn't being lazy. There's actually a reason that those are plus 1. We're going to call this table L because otherwise it's going to take a really long time to refer to it every time. And what this table will represent is the ith jth index of the table is the length of the longest common subsequence, LCS, of x string from 0 to i, that's an exclusive i by the way, and the y string from 0 up to j. So this means that L of 0, 0 is the longest common subsequence of the empty string and the empty string. And L of M, N is kind of our goal here. That's the length of the LCS of X and Y, the entire string. So X from 0 to N, uh, I guess these should be switched. This should be N. I made that worse. That's an N, that's an M. So uh, N, M is our goal. That's the length of the LCS of X, the entire string, and Y, the entire string. And something that you'll just kind of have to trust me on until we get to the end of the algorithm. If we have this table of all the lengths of the LCSs, we can use that to figure out what the actual LCS itself is. But we're only going to focus on the length for now because it's really easy to get back to the LCS later. So we need a base case. Just like a recursive algorithm, dynamic programming needs some kind of base case. And what that's going to be is L of 0 and any number, I just put K for any number, and L of Q and 0, this Q is also any number, is 0. And remember, having a 0 here means I'm considering 0 characters out of X or 0 characters out of Y. Those are the empty string. And the only subsequence you can have in common with the empty string is nothing, because the empty string has no characters. The only subsequence of the empty string is nothing. So no matter what I'm comparing it with, it's always 0. So if you think about this in like a grid format, this is the far left column and the top row. And those are going. we're just going to fill those out with all zeros. Then this is how we're going to fill out the rest of the table. L of ij, so ij thing, we're going to look if the characters at those exact positions in the string match. So if x of i and y of j are the same character, then that means that how I can think about this problem is I look at the two strings without that character on. I think about, OK, what's the lar longest LCS? Well, let me write down. So let's say that like this little squiggle is my x string, and this little squiggle is my y string. 
then I add the same character onto the both of the end of them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, what is the longest common subsequence of only the squiggles? Because the longest common subsequence of the squiggles plus A is just the longest common subsequence of the squiggles plus 1. You just add this A onto the rest of it. It doesn't matter what these are, I can just add A onto both of their longest common subsequences and I get a valid subsequence. So in code, that's just L of I minus 1, J minus 1, plus 1. The alternative is, what if these characters don't match up? Well, in that case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look, okay, what if I only added one of the characters instead of both of them? So I'm going to look at L of I minus 1, J, and L of I, J minus 1. So that's, what if I only added the character to the first squiggle, or what if I only added the character to the second squiggle? And I'm just going to take whichever one is bigger. Because that's going to be the case of, okay, I'm not going to include this character in my LCS. So this is, I include the character in my LCS for both strings. This is, I don't include it for both strings. And the key concept of this is, if for this table, by the time I get to ij, if I filled up everything above it and to the left of it, I can calculate both of these in O of one time, which means that, in theory, every cell of this table takes O of one time to calculate. Then what we can do is once we fill out this entire table, we can go backwards through it to actually get that string itself that we wanted. And I will show you how to do that on the viz tool because it's honestly easier than trying to explain the algorithm on the board. So, how long does this algorithm take? Well, we had an exponential algorithm before, but now we have an m by n table where each cell takes O of 1 time to complete. So, this entire algorithm takes O of m n time. It's just the amount of time to fill out the table. Uh, it turns out that actually getting the LCS itself takes less time than this, so we don't need to consider that part. It's just O of m n. So, let's go over to the viz tool now and do an example and see what it looks like. That's our Kruskal's example from before. Let's go ahead and switch it over to longest common subsequence. And you'll notice here we actually do have the code right next to it for your convenience. This isn't something we give on a homework, so it's not like you're getting homework code here. So this just helps you. You can see we have our two strings here, Georgia Tech and Heritage. Uh, no space in Georgia Tech because that wouldn't really help us at all. This word has no spaces, so that wouldn't add to the LCS. You'll notice these first column and row this is the empty string, and that's going to be all zeros because obviously there is no subsequence with the empty string that's common. So let's start filling out this table. We're going to start at this upper left corner, and we're going to go just row by row, left to right, filling out this entire table until we get down to this bottom right corner. So you'll note that I'm going to check if these two characters right here are the same and this is why if you ever like writing this table out write out the actual strings next to it character by character like this because for every cell you're going to just be checking if that corresponding character is a match or not if that character isn't a max a match i take the max of the cell above it and the cell to the left of it in this case everything's a zero right now so if i don't have a character match i'm just going to keep getting a zero so all of these up until right here down at the end, since there's no matches, these are all just going to be zeros. You'll note if it, they're both of the same when you're taking the max, it doesn't really matter where you take from. The viz tool, I think, always takes from the top. So now we get down to the end, and these h's do match together. So this means I look at up and to the left, this diagonally connected cell. I take that value and add 1. So this is a 0, which means over here I'm going to get a 1 and you'll see it's populated a 1 there. And that means that the longest common subsequence of H and Georgia Tech is length 1. So let's start filling out this second row. We're not going to get a match there. Here we do have a character match, so we'll take this diagonal cell, add 1, and get a 1 here. And then we're not going to get any other matches until we get down to this E at the end. But now when we take the max of the up and left cell, that's now always the left cell because that's a 1. Remember, you always continue on that value every time you don't get a match. 
So once you get a 1 here, this means at the very least, this entire block of the grid will not be a 0. It'll only possibly be a 1. Or bigger. So we get down through all the mismatches to list another match. So we look at the up left thing, increment it by 1, and put it there. You'll notice that was the same as if this wasn't a match, which is fine. That happens sometimes, but the algorithm's going to run the same way. Sometimes this will matter, sometimes it won't. You'll see a, a case down here where it actually does matter, but with these E's it doesn't make any difference. Alright, this third row, you'll see we're not going to have any matches till we get to this R. This first one's going to be a zero, because there's only zeros next to it. And then these next two are both going to be ones because of the cell above it. And then we get down to this R. They match, so we look at the diagonal cell, add one, and we put a two here. Which means now all of the rest of these cells, since they're not matches, we're going to hold over this two because that's the larger value. Now we get down to this I row. We're going to have no matches up till here, but remember, this 0 carries down, then these 1s, then these 2s. Now we get to this I match, so we increment the diagonal value, and now we have a sub sequence of length 3. And the rest is just going to keep along this same 3 that we've incremented to. Now this T will have no, again, same thing we've seen before, no matches till here, so let's go ahead and run through that. We have a match, so we increment the diagonal value and we'll have a 4 here now. We get down to this A row, this beginning stuff is all the things we've seen before, until we get to this A. Now here, we take the diagonal value, this 3, increment it by 1, and that means we're putting a 4 here. Now you'll notice, if we didn't have a match here, this wouldn't be a 4, but we do already have 4s in our table. So you can see this block of 4s now kind of has two corners in it, and that's going to become relevant at the end of the algorithm. I'm just pointing it out for now so you notice it. This final row. We're finally going to get these G's to match at the beginning, so we finally have a 1 in this left side. The rest of this stuff is pretty normal. We're going to get another corner in our block of 3's, but that one's not going to be as relevant as the 4's, which is why I wanted to point the 4's out. And finally, these E's. You should be able to expect what everything's going to be at this point. We have our two matches with the E, and both of those are going to be increments. So we will get a 5 in this cell. And this means that the bottom right corner of our table, which is the element we care about the most, is a 5. This means that Heritage and Georgia Tech have a common LCS of length 5. Now, how do we figure out what it is? The first step that we no normally do is we draw out these borders. You'll notice all these borders just go along the edges of each set. So this goes along all the 1s, this divides the 1s and 2s, this divides the 2s and 3s, 3s and 4s, 4s and 5s. Then what we're going to do is we're going to start at the bottom right corner, and we're going to alternate going up and left as much as we possibly can, or sorry, we're going to go up and left as much as we possibly can until we reach the border, a corner of one of these blocks. Now when I say go up and left, you have to go one direction, then the other, as much as you can each way. So I can't go up one, left one, up one, left one, up one, left one. I have to go all the way to the left, then all the way up, or all the way up and all the way to the left. You can pick which one you're going to do, all up, all left, or all left, all up and you might get different subsequences. This is actually an example of that. That's where this uh, corner is going to come in. So, we go all the way to the left. We would try to go all the way up, but we're already at the corner. And once you reach a corner, what you do is you look at the character that that corner represents. In this case, it's an E. You add the E to the end of your subsequence, 
and then move diagonally through the corner, up left and up one and left one. So you'll see we've added an E, uh, and then added we moved up and left to this cell. Uh, this I haven't I don't actually remember. You can either add the character to the end or add it to the beginning and then flip the string at the end. Uh, it doesn't matter. So now we have to make a choice. You'll note if we go left and then up, we'll end here. If we go up and then left, we'll end here. Those are different characters. And this is because these two strings have multiple longest common subsequences. But in these problems, we usually only care about finding one of them. So this implementation choice doesn't matter that often. In this algorithm, you see we go up first, and then we try to go left, but we obviously can't. So we're going to add this T to our subsequence at the beginning and then move diagonally up to this one. So like before, we try to go up, we can't. We go left to this wall. Then we're going to go diagonally up and left, adding this I to the beginning of our subsequence and going up and left to this two. Then we move to the next corner, add the R. Then from here, we move to the next corner and add this E. Once you hit the zeros, you can stop uh, because there's no more character matches beyond that point. And you can see we've created our length five subsequence ERITE. -E. If here you had gone left instead of up, uh, you would have gotten ERIAE, -E, I believe. And both of those you can see are valid subsequences. You see ERIAE -E and ERIAE. -E. So multiple longest common subsequences. Which directions you take determines which one you get. Um, but usually we'll tell you to pick one in a diagramming question, or we'll give you an example that only has one valid subsequence. So this is the longest common subsequence algorithm. Feel free to play around with it yourself. If you have time, you can try to code it up yourself and code the actual getting of the subsequence back. It's a fun problem, but you obviously don't have to do it for this class. I'll give you guys a couple minutes to ask questions. And then I will spend a little bit of the end of this recitation talking about the proof of the Kruskal's time complexity, uh, because I think it's a little interesting, even if you don't need to know th that proof for this course. All right, haven't had any questions yet. So let's go back to the board and see if we can explain this part. So if you'll remember, I said Kruskal's time complexity was O of V or E log V, but I didn't really explain why. So let's talk about it. Where does it come from? If you think about Kruskal's, there's really four things that I have to do. I need to initialize the disjoint set, which I'm going to abbreviate here as DS. I need to initialize the priority queue. I have all of the DQs that I do from the priority queue. And then I have all of those union find operations, which here I'm just going to write as union find. So that's every time in Kruskal's I did like a find things or union things. I that those things obviously take some amount of time. The question is how long and does it impact the time complexity of our algorithm? Well, let's look at it. Initializing the disjoint set, you'll kind of need to trust me on this one, but you can actually do it in O of one time. And the strategy for that is basically instead of going through all of the vertices and putting them in the disjoint set at the very beginning, 
what you do is you do absolutely nothing. And the very first time you try to call find on a vertex, if it's not initialized in your disjoint set, you initialize it then. And initializing each vertex only takes over one time. So by doing it this way, you don't have to do any extra operations at the beginning. Uh, fun fact, our original implementation of disjoint sets actually didn't do this in O one time. Uh, I was one of the people that fixed it, which we didn't even use this semester. Then initializing the priority queue. You'll remember I said we use the build heap algorithm for this, so which means that it's going to be kind of O of n time, where n is the le amount of things we put into it. What do we put into this priority queue? Well, that's every single edge. So doing build heap on every single edge is going to be O of E time. Then we have the DQs from the priority queue. So we have two things here. How long does each DQ take and how many DQs do I have to do? Well, the how many DQs do I have to do is we want to kind of think about the worst case. The worst case is I have to DQ uh, every single edge from my priority queue. So in that case, there's E edges in my priority queue, which means I would need to do the DQ E times. And then how long does each DQ take? If you remember, priority queues are, heap oper are heaps, uh, which means that heap operations each take log time. Now, a very key thing here is log of what? It's a log of what's in it. And in this case, since we have all of the edges in it, that's going to be log of E, because there's E things in our priority queue. And this is the first thing where people are going to start being confused. Because here I have a log E, but everywhere else in this class where you see the uh, graph efficiencies, it's log V. So that should be one of the first questions in your head, is where is this log E going to go, and how are we going to get rid of it? And I'll get to that, I promise you. Then we have these union find operations. Again, same question. How many do we do, and how long do they take? The how many we do should be pretty obvious at this point. It's going to be the same as these DQs, because every time we DQ an edge, we might have to do these union find operations, which means that it's going to be E times something. How long do the union find operations take? Well, none of you would inherently know this unless you've seen this stuff before, because this is a data structure we've never talked about in this class. So you'll have to believe me, and you can look up the proofs for why this is the efficiency. But these union find operations, doing E of them, takes uh, E times alpha of, in this case, V time. So the obvious question at this point is, what is alpha? Because that's a symbol that we've never used in this course for anything. So I should probably explain what it is. And alpha is relatively simple. Alpha is just the inverse of a function called a. Simple, right? Well, no, I obviously need to explain what a is. Now, a is the Ackerman function. If you want to look it up on your own. Uh, for people that are familiar with it, I'm kind of using like the one input version where you just use the same input twice. So what is the Ackerman function actually? First thing I want to point out is, I'm since I'm dealing with time complexities, the important thing to look at is growth rate. Exponentials are really bad because they grow very fast, and logarithms are really good because they grow really slowly. When I take the inverse of a function, I kind of switch how fast and slow it grows. The inverse of an exponential is a logarithmic. So if I take the inverse of a really fast growing function, I get a really slow growing function. So for this time complexity to be good for the alpha, Ackerman should be a really large and a really fast growing time complexity. So what is it? Well, unfortunately, in order to explain what it is, I need to actually introduce a new notation for math that a lot of you probably haven't seen before. And that notation is known as Knuth up arrow notation. And it's pretty simple. It's just an up arrow. And I'm not going to describe exactly what it means. I'm just going to give you some examples of how it does and how absolutely insane this singular up arrow can be. Oh, well, especially when it's not a singular up arrow. Let's sit down and give you some examples. Relatively tame example would be something like 3 up arrow 2. 
That's a small number. It's 9. Now, let's try uh, incrementing that number on the right. Let's look at 3 up arrow 3 instead. That still isn't that bad. That number's only at 27. You can probably see the pattern on these ones. It's relatively simple. This is just exponentiation. Well, let's look at 3 up arrow 4. Most of you probably figured it out. That's 81. It's just 3 to the 4th power. So 1 up arrow is pretty tame. It's nothing that you haven't seen before. But the power of these up arrows is that I don't need to have just one of them. What if I have multiple up arrows? What if I have 3 up arrow, up arrow, 2? In this case, uh, that number is actually going to be 27. Not a coincidence, this is the same thing as down here. Uh, kind of a coincidence, but not really. They represent the same thing. They're both 3 to the 3. What if I look at 3 up arrow, up arrow, 3? What is this number? Well, this number is about 7.6 trillion. So, we went up numbers pretty fast. We went from 27 to 7.6 trillion, which is a really large jump. Let's, let's just take a look. What, what if I look at 3 up arrow, up arrow, 4? That number has about 3 trillion digits. Notice that this number was just 7.6 trillion. It's a big number, but something you could write down. That's, what, like 13 digits or so. This number has 3 trillion digits. If you wanted to write this number down in its fully expanded form, no extra notation, and you wrote at a speed of one digit per second, this number would take you 115,000 years to write. To write the number down, that is insane. Up arrow notation is insane. How does that relate to the Ackerman function? Uh, I have a question. Why is 3 up arrow, up arrow 27? That's 3 up arrow, up arrow 2. What that actually represents is this is a stack of 3s too high. So this is 3 to the 3, this is 3 to the 3 to the 3, and this is 3 to the 3 to the 3 to the 3. And an important note here that uh, a lot of people missed the first time is that there's no parentheses on these numbers, which means I evaluate the exponents first. So this isn't like 9 to the 3rd, or this isn't 27 to the 3rd, this is 3 to the 27th. And this is 3 to the 7.6 trillion, which is why it's such a ridiculous number. So how does this relate to the Ackerman function? Well, Ackerman function of just 5, so a very small input to the Ackerman function, this number already has 3 up arrows. Which you can imagine, two up arrows gets really insane. Three up arrows goes nuts really fast. For reference, like Ackerman function of one and two and such, those are pretty small numbers. Four is a really big number, and five is pretty unimaginable. And for this reason, it is very fair to say that for all numbers that fit within our universe, the inverse Ackerman function of n is less than 5, and that is n honestly pretty crazy for a function. This is a real, this is an actual, like, non-decreasing function, so this function goes up as you increase n in theory, and that function just does, it kind of just feels like it stops at 4. It doesn't, you could theoretically have numbers that get it to 5, but those numbers don't even fit within our universe. So this function grows really slowly, which is good, because that means we get fast time complexities. So now that we know that the Ackerman function is small, let's write this whole thing together. So we've got these four terms, let's add them together. Obviously this O of 1 term can get dropped. It's not going to be relevant to our time complexity because we can drop lower order terms. Here, I'm going to use another little trick. Uh, I have room to write. Remember that even when we have kind of the most number of edges that we possibly can, that's in a dense graph, what that means is that E is on the order of V squared. That's kind of our worst case. 
which means even in this worst case, log of e would be log of v squared. And if you remember from rules about logarithms, we can take this exponent and move it out to the front. We get 2 times log of v. But since we're dealing with big O time complexities here, we can drop any of these coefficients. So we can just kind of cross out this 2. I'm just going to say because big O. Because we don't care about these coefficients. This means that I can turn log e into log v. So now instead of e log e, I can write this as e log v. And those are the same thing in big O notation. So now we look at these two together, and I can kind of uh, write them as e times log v plus alpha v. But remember that alpha v is really small, which means that compared to log v, it's a lower order term. So I can cross it out. And I'm left with e plus e log v. And I can rewrite that. I'm sorry, I'm kind of going in a snaky pattern here. But I can rewrite that as e times log v plus 1. And then obviously here, I, since I'm in big O notation, I can drop these lower order terms like that. And I'm just left with the big thing that we started with at the very beginning. It's going to snake all the way down here of e log v. And that is the time complexity of cross goals. I hope you've enjoyed this little rant about math. Again, not really relevant in this class, but hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you enjoyed big numbers as much as I do. Uh, that is the end of this recitation, though. Uh, there haven't been any questions, and this we don't. I don't really have time to take questions about this. Uh, feel free to send me emails or post on Piazza if you have questions about like specifically this part. But honestly, uh, stuff like number file videos or looking at things on the internet are probably going to give you more detailed explanations. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this recitation, and I will see you guys all next.